You're listening to episode 72, Growing by Doing the Work Necessary to Heal, with David Moody. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thank you for joining me for this episode. I hope that you had a good week, and I'm excited to bring you another episode this week. Before we get into it, I just want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past, that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an mp3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you can go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So today I'm going to be joined by survivor David Moody of moodyspeaks.com. David is also the founder and CEO of CD Moody Construction of Atlanta, Georgia, which has helped build some of Atlanta's famous structures. We don't really talk about that here in the episode, but I wanted to mention it because I think it's pretty cool. And also, if it's something that you're interested in, then I definitely recommend going and and checking out David's company and seeing all that they have built there in Atlanta. But here are some of the things that we are going to talk about today. And really kind of a theme for the episode is living a good life in spite of your past. That's something that both David and I believe is possible, and David's going to talk about how that has been possible for him. David's going to share with us his experience of being sexually abused in the 1960s and what that really meant as far as him being able to talk about what happened, or in this case, not talk about what happened, and how that impacted his recovery journey. He's going to share how his mother's well-meaning advice to not let anyone touch him ended up backfiring, and actually what he brings up in regard to that is really important. And he's going to talk about how he planned on keeping what happened to him a secret forever. He was 36 before he told anyone, and then he went another 21 years before speaking about it publicly. And he's going to talk about how it took him so long to connect the dots between what had happened to him and the after effects that he was experiencing from that. We're also going to talk about how we have to do the work if we want to heal. There's no easy way around it, unfortunately, as you all know. He's going to share his advice for anyone who hasn't told someone yet. So if you're someone who hasn't been able to talk about what you've gone through, either you're afraid to, or you're not sure how to go about it, then I think you'll find David's advice really helpful. And then he's also going to talk about how he's been able to not care what others think of him, which is really important. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode. I really appreciate David for coming on the show. Uh, he's a he's a really busy guy with everything that he has going on with his business and uh, the work that he's trying to do for survivors now as well. So I'm grateful to have him here to share his inspiring story with us. So without further ado, I'm going to go bring David on. David, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Glad to be here, Melissa. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here, and I'm glad that we got connected. We got connected through past guest Leanna Johnson, but as it turns out, you also know Chris Anderson and Mike Pistorino, who have also been on the show, so that's cool. But yeah, I'm glad that we got connected because 
you and I are trying to spread a similar message as survivors. I'm doing it from the bullying survivor perspective, and you're doing it from the sexual abuse survivor perspective. But we both believe in being able to live a good life in spite of our past. That is so true. Yeah. And I know that you are living a good life today, David, and I'm excited to have you share that with us. But what we do here is start at the beginning so that we know where you're coming from and have you take us on that journey that leads to where you are today. How does that sound to you? Sounds like a plan. All right. Yeah. So if you want to start us out and just, you know, share with us what you'd like us to know about your experience, and we'll go from there. Sure. Well, I'm like most baby boomers. Um, I'll be turning 60 in a few months. So when all this transpired was in the mid-1960s. It was uh, in a time where people didn't talk about it, didn't even really acknowledge it. They thought more of the person with the trench coat being the abuser. There was no real information out. The study has shown 80% of predators is usually someone the family knows or close to the family, and that's pretty much what happened to me. I was the son of a babysitter, and he was 17. I was about nine and a half, and as always, they they set you up, they groom you, and, and unfortunately, then the damage is done um, with the sexual abuse, and then the threats take place. And one of the key things that I speak on for parents is that my mother had an inkling something might have happened. And she called me into her room and she called herself really protecting me and helping me. But when she said, don't let anyone touch you as a kid, it had already happened. So now I thought it was my fault. So I definitely didn't say anything. So Mm -hmm. as a parent, you know, I have two adult children, but I share with other parents, we have or anyone in charge of children to be very careful of how we say certain things, because if something has already transpired, um, most children definitely aren't going to say anything, especially if after you've been threatened and you feel as though it was your fault and you've done something really bad. Yeah, it's so true. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you end up getting those wrong messages when really you just, you need that support and someone to be able to to turn to. Right. And, of course, in the 60s, I mean, you definitely weren't going to talk about it. And I was one of the fortunate ones because uh, my mother got an inkling something had, was going on and the person was never back allowed in the house. Um, then at 14, we moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan for my father's job. So being removed completely from the environment allowed me to completely bury it. But at the same time, that wasn't the best thing to do either, because when I finally dealt with it at 36, uh, I ended up having panic attacks, uh, suffering post-traumatic stress syndrome, had a complete nervous breakdown. But fortunately, counseling, the love of my wife, and then my own desire to get better and get stronger, but it was a real journey and um, it's not easy. So I speak up now to help others that feel hopeless or feel alone or don't have a voice that not only can you survive, but you can thrive and do some incredible things with your life. And I decided also I was not going to let the person that abused me control my life because at the end of the day, everybody has a story of some type. Might not be as bad as what we've been through. It could be worse, but everybody has a story. And I just a firm believer we work together by sharing information to help others that feel alone and uh, abandoned. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you ended up, you know, just keeping this to yourself for many years. Uh, You said until you were 36, right? Right. And what was it like for you during that time? Like, w- were you kind of just getting on with your life? Were things kind of, did they seem normal? Or was it was it impacting you during those years as well? When I look back, there was some, you know, like I, there was one time at 15, right before I got my license, all of a sudden I just started losing a bunch of weight. They couldn't figure out what it was. I was about 10 or 11 
I woke up one day visiting my grandparents saying I couldn't breathe. They took me to the hospital. I was always worried about something. Uh, so there were little, when I, I don't want to say little, but there were a number of things that were going on when I look back now that was a result for that, a result from it. But I was able to stay so busy and always going and doing that it didn't affect me as bad as it did when I finally released it. But I also, my self-esteem wasn't good. Um, I, I, I would give up easy, but I still would excel. I hope that makes sense. You know, it was, I could get frustrated or want to quit sometimes if somebody said, ah, you won't make it or you can't do it. So those are the kind of things when I look back now, I see how it did truly affect me. But thankfully, God blessed me in, in his grace. I didn't have my panic attacks or my breakdown until I was 36 years old and I was in the right environment for that, that to happen. If it had happened to me in college or right after college, I don't know if I would have recovered the way I did. Mm. Mm, it's interesting. Yeah. And during this time when you were when you were being affected by it, were you aware that it was from the abuse? No, I never knew it was from the abuse. I mean, you know, you got to think about it. It's probably most of us survivors. None of us think something 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago could impact us the way it does. I mean, I would think about it every now and then, but there was no way that I think that was connected. But also you have to remember, no one talked about you know, panic attacks, post-traumatic stress syndrome during that time I was coming along. Uh, I mean, even today, mental health is still looked at as, as a negative or you're crazy or something. So even mm -hmm. people who have suffered from panic attacks and anxiety and stuff still don't like to talk about it because of the stigma that goes with it. And that's the other reason I speak up, because I want people to know that just because someone suffers from anxiety or post-traumatic post-traumatic stress syndrome doesn't mean they're crazy or something's wrong with them it's just something we have to deal with yeah um now were you thinking about the abuse during this time you know when you were younger before you started talking about it um or had you just kind of repressed those memories i mean they were very deep but every now and then a smell or sound or a certain situation can make me think about it for just a minute but i never i mean my brain and my body worked so well together in burying it and it is very very true when it says you can really bury something um i mean i would think about it but again it'd be minimal because i just it was kind of one of those things for me as a man and being heterosexual um i didn't even want to acknowledge that another man did that to me. So it was also the fact I didn't even want to admit it or acknowledge it. Sure, sure. I mean, were you feeling very confused at this time, though, as to, you know, why you were experiencing these certain effects, you know, but you weren't quite making that connection at that point? No, I never really got confused about why is it happening, because it happened so rarely, you know, a couple of times I got like, dizzy or lightheaded or, you know, I only had a couple of moments where I couldn't breathe once as a child. And then the one time I lost weight, I mean, I, I was a, a compulsive worrier though, but I just thought that just kind of was my makeup, but I never, ever put two and two together because I stayed busy. I played college football, you know, I was finished college and I went to architecture school working. So I kept myself so busy that I didn't really allow myself a lot of free time to think. And when I look back, I believe that was part of my safety mechanism and how I kept stuff buried was I constantly stayed busy. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you were just kind of attributing it to different uh, right. other things. Right. Yeah. So I want to talk, you know, now about when you first told someone about what happened, right? So you're 36 years old. And now, what was it that happened? I believe that you had found out that 
a family member had been abused as well, and then that kind of yeah. opened that. Well, we found out, you know, someone on my wife's side had been sexually abused, and, and I just said it out loud. And I wasn't planning on it. I planned on going to my grave with it. And um, after I said it, I didn't think much of it. But it was a few months later after I said it, it was kind of like a pressure cooker. And when you let that pressure off, how all of it kind of just comes out, all the steam. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of like, I think, holding that for 26 years and finally saying that. A few months later, I started having a really bad panic attacks and then just a uh, complete nervous breakdown. But I had a complete nervous breakdown and kept working, though. Uh, my wife would patch me together. Fortunately, my company was young. It was four years old. So I had flexibility on what I went in and when I went in. Um, but I could function enough to take care of business. And that's another one of those moments where I know there is a God because there's no way I could have made it without that, without my wife and God carrying me through that time. Cause I was, I was probably as far as you can go and still make it. Um, I was pretty broken. Mm, that must've been very difficult. Yeah, it was, especially when you still, I didn't know what was the cause of it, you know, cause I'm not thinking 26 years later, that could be the case. So mm. I'm thinking, I, so, so you had like, you had, you know, said that this had happened to you and then you started to experience these symptoms two months later, two months later, yeah. but you, you weren't, you still weren't making that connection yet. No, because again, you got to remember in 1992, people still weren't talking about those connections. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking, cause I went to my doctor, he said, oh, you just stress, you know, take some Valium, get some rest. So that's all, you know, so questioning to trigger it or any you know to put those two together and that's also why i speak up because if you don't know how to put two and two together you can really go down a bad track because that of getting the proper counseling and help because also as a survivor you're not going to just automatically say to a doctor hey this is what happened you think is when my childhood do you think this could be a part of it because again right. in 1992 those stories didn't exist now today there's enough information in the internet that you can start putting two and two together a lot easier, a lot quicker. Mm hmm. Yeah. So when did you start putting two and two together? Um, believe it or not, it was one day at the church talking to a, a psychologist a friend and kind of told him a little bit. And they kind of told me I was having panic attacks. I still didn't tell them what happened to me as a child. And then I went and saw a counselor, and then I kind of told him, and then we start putting two and two together. Mm. Gotcha. But I still didn't start speaking publicly to 2013, so I went another 21 years of basically complete silence other than my wife and a couple of close friends and people in business. Yeah, yeah. And what, what was the response that you got from them when you told them about what happened? I'm going to tell you I, I've never been more pleased with the response from people and loved ones from 1992, those folks. But since I really started speaking out, the response has been phenomenal. It's been very positive, but more importantly, it's all the people who said thank you for allowing them to finally say it. A lot of people I don't know and people I know have spoken to me and just said thank you uh, because that actually happened to them or someone close to them. And, and they had never said it before in their life. Yeah, that, that's really great. And so what was life like for you during the time from when you, uh, you know, told just a few people about it to when you started speaking publicly about it? Like, were you working on your healing during that time or, or what was it like? Yeah, I actually was healing from 1992 to 213. I mean, I'm still healing, but it's a different kind of healing. Um, I finally got comfortable. I finally... Um, I, I tell people now I reach that point where I feel like my senses are at a heightened uh, level where I really feel, see, smell, touch things in a way I'd never had before in a very good way. Uh, it's like being free. I feel extremely free. I don't feel as though I'm damaged goods. Now, I still have moments with panic attacks. I, I don't have them, but I have anxiety. 
I still have moments where I have to push myself. I still have moments where that uh, PTSD can creep up from certain situations where I get fear or certain things, but I understand it. I know how to work through it. And, and I'm doing things that I normally might have talked myself out of doing uh, exciting things, travel. So it's, um, it's been an interesting journey. I have a book that will be coming out in about three weeks that tells about the whole journey. And then I have, of course, my website, moodyspeaks.com, where other survivors speak. And I share my blog and my journey uh, with others. Yeah, that's really great. And congratulations on your book. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so so let's talk, you know, a little bit about the things that that you did to help you to get to where you are today. What what were some of those things? There were a few things I did to really help me uh, get to where I am today. And one thing I, I tell everyone, everybody has to find their own time, own path to go. I'm not a professional counselor. I, I'm just a survivor that sells, shares his story. I share my story to help others. Counseling was very important. The love of my wife was just phenomenal. I, I wouldn't have made it without her, my faith. Uh, but also a deep desire inside of me to be better and want to heal. Because I, you have to put the work in. One thing I tell folks, there's no magic pill. There's no magic counseling. There reaches a point where we have to put the work in. That's really important because if it was a magic pill or magic counseling, you know, we all would be okay pretty quick. But there's work that we have to be willing to put in. And when I say work, it's that internal work. It's that belief in working through the negative thoughts, the negative things that we have allowed ourselves to grab hold to and work through those. But counseling, faith, exercise, uh, and the love of other people, those are the things that really helped me get to the next level. But also allowing myself to talk to others, and not be afraid to share with others and then hear where others have gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what was it like for you when you started sharing it publicly? What kind of response did you get then? Sharing publicly has been phenomenal. Um, speaking in Illinois, uh, April 1st, and three different places in Georgia in April. The very first time I spoke was at the Georgia Center for Child Advocacy. I was the keynote speaker at their big breakfast fundraiser. And that was the first time I spoke publicly and I just broke down in the middle of speaking and just cried through the whole thing. But since then, it was almost like a release. But now, you know, I speak with strength because I know I'm doing something to help others and I no longer feel that uh, feeling that would cause me to cry about it. Mm hmm. Now, I'm curious, um, when you told your, your mom about it, did she say that she had suspected something had happened? No, my mother and I, we and my dad, you know, I told them what happened, but they never really spoke of it. And, you know, as a parent, you always feel as though you failed or you did something wrong. So I don't even have conversations with them because I know that's too tough for them because I know how it would feel for me, mm -hmm. you know, but and plus they're from a different generation. Like I'm from a different generation. Mm -hmm. So we kind of yeah. leave that subject uh, where it is with them. Gotcha. But they support my website. They love what I'm doing, but we really don't talk about as far as what happened to me with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about, you know, how you're doing today overall. I know you say you still have some things that you have struggle with, you know, PTSD and, um, and the anxiety, but, um, but how are you doing overall? What does your life look like today? Oh, overall, my life is great. now. I mean, and it was always good when I look at it. I just had to deal with the, the damage done. But to me, my life today is just free, but also that has to do with age. You know, I'm about to turn 60. I got adult children and I'm glad that I've done it when I've done it because I get to really just enjoy my wife and I in a way 
that I wouldn't have been able to enjoy us if I hadn't healed or uh, taken this journey of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, tell us a little more about what it is that you do today. I know you've talked about it a little bit with your website, um, but but just, you know, just fill us in on, on what you have going on. Well, I went to Harvard last year. My wife and I moved up to uh, Cambridge and lived up there for four months for a semester. It was a year's program, but we only had to live up there for a year. And it was the Advanced Leadership Initiative. And it's for leaders and CEOs who want to make a difference in the world. And that's where I took my blog and expanded it into a website. I decided to write my book and completed my book. And I learned that one person can make a difference in the world by just sharing our stories and having a uh, something that's important to us. Uh, I'm still running my business, which I love, a major commercial construction company. Do a lot of hiking, get outdoors. I've really gotten into photography because I see things now in a way that I didn't see. It's like I feel like scabs have been removed from my eyes where I really have a sense of seeing things. Uh, I still have moments with anxiety, as I said, but um, I'm enjoying life. I just, And I'm also enjoying helping others because there are other people who suffer from anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD. They weren't sexually abused from other traumas. And just helping people realize we can overcome anything. It's not easy but we can, and we can just have a great life. And I just want to keep trying to give others hope and also give a voice to those that feel that they can't say anything. And not everybody is going to speak up, and that's okay. And my website was really designed to give people a private way to go do some research, find out other organizations they can call, other places they could go, see other successful stories and hear encouragement from other survivors so they know one they're not alone but two they can heal and be healthy and have a great life mm -hmm. that's great yeah i love that message and i think it's it's so true you know and um yeah it's gonna take some work and there's still gonna be you know, uh, things that are going to creep up and remind us of the past. Um, but yeah, we can absolutely have a great life. Yep. No doubt. No doubt. And that's what I'm focused on. Just, I want to help people not take 45 years like me to finally get to this point. Uh, I want to give people uh, courage by hearing other stories and know, take that step to heal. Take that first step of counseling. Take whatever that step is they need to take to start moving forward. And that's what my whole mission is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, what would you say to someone who, you know, hasn't talked about what's happened to them yet and they're afraid to? Well, you know, what, what would be your advice for them? My advice to anybody who hasn't said anything and they're struggling you have to do it in your time, your space. I tell people, be very careful telling someone what you need to do. That person has to work at their level. The biggest thing I would try to tell them is don't be afraid to take that first step. Fight through the fear. That's what I tell people, because when you go through this, you have so many imaginary fears and fear just stops you dead in your tracks. So what I try and do is get people to understand Find that safe, comfortable way that works for you and take that first step of healing and they'll never regret going forward. Mm. Yeah. And it is so true to, uh, you know, to do it on your own time. I think that's... Yeah, you have to do it on your own time. Yeah. The other thing I've learned is when people love to tell people, it's in your head, just let it go. Well, yeah, it is in your <laughs> right. head, but you just don't let it go like that. Once it's in right. your head, it stays there forever. I mean, I would live with this my entire life, but it doesn't have to control my life in a negative way. Right, exactly. It's about finding that way to to live a good life in spite of it. And, right. you know, know that, like, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be a part of who you are. 
but it doesn't have to control the way you're living now and right. the things that you can do. Right. And it's a fact. I mean, I'm a better person. I'm a better husband, a better father, better business person. Uh, cause I don't live in fear of worrying about what will people think if they heard, what would people think if they found out, um, uh, I don't worry about having panic attacks. If I have one, I just have one. Um, so those are the kind of things I've really grown and gotten more comfortable with, where I used to be in constant fear of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't care what people think. I don't, I'm not worried about people thinking something's wrong with me. It's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. What, what do you think has allowed you to have that perspective on it, though? Uh, learning. Uh, I've learned that. I'm not, you know, I might have been abused, but I'm a survivor. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. Uh, And I'm a strong survivor. And what I've also learned, we are much stronger than we realize we are as people. That's the one thing I've really learned from this. We are so strong. We just have to allow ourselves to show ourselves that kind of strength because we are really, really strong. Because when you think about it, even the survivors that haven't said anything who are struggling, they're still stronger than they realize because they still get up every day. They still live every day. And mm-hmm. uh, we're just much stronger than we give ourselves credit for. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, David, I want to ask you the final question that I have for you. Sure. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? That's a great last question. What piece of advice would I give myself if I could go back in time? I know this is going to sound really weird, but I wouldn't change anything because everything happened the time period it needed to happen. If I had a, you know, there are times when I wish I had said something as, as a kid to my parents. Well, in the mid-60s, if that had gotten out in the neighborhood, I would have been toast. Um, so society did, didn't handle this, didn't deal with it when I was coming along. So I wouldn't change anything. And I really wouldn't give myself any advice other than to say, believe in yourself sooner and also dream big sooner. So those were, that's probably the only advice I would give because I really wouldn't change anything. Uh, from the timetable that everything transpired because the world wasn't ready to deal with it the way it is now and the way we're improving and the way we have um, organizations to help the internet. So society wasn't ready for a baby boomer to deal with it the way we are now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. But kudos to you for, you know, getting through that in spite of that. Oh, thank you. I you know? appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, before I let you go, um, what's the best way for people to connect with you or, you know, find out more about what you have going on? Sure. People can connect with me through moodyspeaks.com. They can find me on Twitter at C Moody, C as in Charles, C Moody 1003, or on Instagram, C Moody 1003. Great. And I'll have that all linked up on your show notes page. Okay, great. And David, I just want to thank you for coming on here and and taking the time and joining me today to share your story and provide hope and inspiration for others out there. And and thank you for the work that you're doing today as well. And I'm sure it's helping a lot of people. Well, I want to thank you for what you're doing, Melissa, because by having shows like this, we're helping to spread the word and help people. One, we're helping with prevention but more importantly we're helping people take that step on that journey of healing and we're giving people courage to heal and know that they can heal that's right that's right great well david i hope that you have a great rest of your day all right thank you very much melissa thanks for listening to the show today this has been the grass gets greener podcast episode 72 go to the grass forward slash david moody to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and found David's story inspiring. 
what I love about it is that, you know, not only has he been able to live a good life and achieve some great things, but he was on his own with what had happened to him for so many years. I mean, he was on his own when it first happened to him because of the time period that he was in, and it wasn't something that people talked about, you know? And then as a result of that, he ended up wanting to keep this a secret that he was going to take to his grave with him. And then when he did end up finally opening up about it for the first time, you know, he ended up having a, a terrible reaction and having panic attacks and experiencing PTSD. And then he went another 21 years before being able to speak about it publicly like he does today. And I say all that to point out that it's never really too late. You know, it's it's never really too late to talk about what happened to you and to heal from it and to get to that point where you are living a good life. I mean, I think there's so much hope right there. But here's the thing. I get that some of you can't see that right now, that you don't think that is possible. But I'll let you in on a little secret. I didn't think it was possible either. At times it felt like I couldn't see more than two feet in front of me. But over time, things can change. And even if that's not a message that you're able to hear right now and to believe in, that's okay. You know, that's that's perfectly fine. But I do this show and I bring on these guests to show you that there is hope and that it's not just me saying that. Hope is the one thing that gets us through and keeps us hanging on. So whether you have hope right now or not, I'm going to keep bringing it. I'm going to bring it for you because I care. And you can know that if you ever need some hope, you can find it right here. And on that note, you can come back to the next episode to find more hope. I'm going to be joined by Mike Gonsalves of The Wellness Bucket. Mike and I have actually known of each other for a couple of years now. So it was really great to have him on and, and we have a great chat. That episode is actually going to be in two weeks though. So if you're listening to this before May 2nd, then be sure to come back on May 2nd to check that one out. You're not going to want to miss it. And if you have a chance, go check out his website. It's thewellnessbucket.com and see what he has going on over there. He's been a huge source of inspiration for me over these past couple of years and I'm looking forward to bringing him on the show to have him inspire you as well. Also, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher if you haven't done so yet to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Have hope.